morning. I, uh, I, I looked on the New York Times this morning because I just was curious about a question. I wanted to see how many articles in the last 24 hours mentioned the word data. There were 42. There have been almost 2,000 this year that have involved the word data. So there's a data conversation happening. Um, the part of the data conversation that I'm most interested in is this idea of what is the lived experience of data? What is it like to live in this new data world? And, and for that, I'll offer up a metaphor, and that is the metaphor of this bizarre system of air travel that we often immerse ourselves in. You know, this system is very, very, very complex, but we often catch just a small glimpse of it. We see that complexity as we pass through the security lineup. We might see it as we see our bag disappear along one of those moving runways. We certainly see it when we're sitting on the airplane and we're seeing the refueling crews coming up and repairing and refueling the airplanes. The fact is, is that when you are on an airplane in the air, you are one of one million people, more than one million people who are currently in the air. It's a staggering figure. But this experience of being part of something that is so complicated that you can barely understand it is, is I think, very closely related to the data experience. And also this idea of kind of a loss of control, right? Getting on an airplane is one of those few times where we allow our, the control to be lost. So I want to talk about what that means to us as we engage in this conversation about data. You know, things are getting more complicated. People have known this for a little while. Um, the American novelist uh, David Foster Wallace, he wrote this book called Infinite Jest. Infinite Jest is full of footnotes. Occasionally those footnotes have footnotes, and occasionally those footnotes to footnotes have footnotes. And when he was asked why he did this, he responded. He said, I wanted to mimic the information flood and data triage that I thought would be, would be a bigger part of US life 15 years from now. Infinite Jest was written 16 years ago. Um, and this word data triage is really interesting to me because what I do, I think, is a form of data triage. And data visualization is a form of data triage. But I think that people have maybe, maybe um, don't have a full understanding of what we can do with data visualization. We, we, we first started hearing about data visualization in the late 1800s, early 1900s with graphics like this. This is Florence Nightingale's graphic showing the casualty count of soldiers. And her point was that soldiers were dying more of disease than they were dying on the battlefield. At the same time, Jon Snow produced this famous graphic, which plotted the incidence of cholera in a certain area of London. And from this graphic, he was able to discover what the source of that cholera epidemic was. In this case, it was a single well. And at the same time, there were medical instruments, which I think helped me define my point uh, quite well, which is th this is a blood pressure meter. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that name on stage, which takes something very complicated, the circulatory system, and makes it simple, right? At the same time, there was the x-ray. Now, the x-ray doesn't make something simple. It shows us something that we have never seen before. So I'd suggest there are two reasons why we visualize data. To reduce things, to make them simpler, and to reveal things, to show us things that we have never seen before. And I'm really interested in this second part of data visualization. This is a piece that I did four years ago called Just Landed. And here I'm listening for tweets. I'm listening for people who have said, I'm just landed in Hawaii, or uh, I've just landed in New York. Right there are these thinly veiled show off tweets. And we can take those <laughs> tweets, and we can put them together into a system, because I know where that person lives, because they've told me in their profile. And I know where they're going, because they just told me on Twitter. And so we can produce a whole system of world travel just from listening to people on Twitter. Uh, a companion project was this one called Good Morning, which is just that. This is everybody on Twitter saying good morning. <laughs> The people who are green dots, those are people who get up early. The people who are red dots, you'll see lots on the West Coast as we move over, are people who get up a little bit later. So this is really exciting. It's simple data, but it's something that we've never seen before. This is a revelatory thing. It was a revelatory thing for me. Now, I spent um, two and a half years at the New York Times. I was the data artist in residence. A lot of you are asking. I did make up that title. And <laughs> I, worked, I worked with this guy. His name is Mark Hansen. He's a statistician. And together, we built a tool to to look at how all of the content that the Times produces is being shared through social networks. We knew that people were talking about these things, but we didn't really know much about that. 
So when I think about complex data sets like this, I always think, how can we build an exploratory tool? How can we build a vehicle that lets us explore this data and lets us find the little pieces of it that might be interesting? So we built this tool called Cascade. So this is a cascade for a story called the um, island where people forgot to die, about an island in the Mediterranean where people live very long, uh, even longer than the neighboring islands. And so we see all of the traffic in this story. And then the interesting thing that I, that I like about this is that we can put this two-dimensional view into three dimensions, and we can see the separate threads of conversation that exist within that discussion. And I was so excited to see this for the first time. I call these the architectures of conversation. We're seeing the actual structure of a conversation as people are sharing and, and talking about this specific story. And every story has one of these cascades. And one of the things that we were really pleased to find out was that different types of stories have different structures. So for example, Nicholas Kristof, his structures tend to be like shrubbery. They, they're low and they spread very far, whereas current event stories tend to be tall like Christmas trees because people People share them very quickly, but they don't share them very long. You know, I, I kind of felt like I was uncovering something that, that was being seen for the first time. And these structures allowed us to talk about this in a real way. Right now, now we can talk about sharing in, in more than um, these kind of loose, very loose conceptual terms. Now, I've been, I've been annoyed a little bit lately because people talk about visualization as a thing. Right? It's like, make me a visualization. Well, visualization is a noun, but it's a verbal noun. It has a verb built into it. It's, visualization is a process. And I like to think about myself as sometimes as a question farmer. And I'm visualizing to get more questions out of things. And often these things are just things that I do for fun. So this is the, the original Kepler project paper that was released about two years ago. You can tell it's important because there's like 85 authors uh, on that paper. And when it was released, I was very excited. And I, and I sat down to read it. And I got to these like, whoa, stunning gripping uh, graphics. <laughs> You know, and I don't want to talk bad about these graphics, because for astronomers, these graphics are very important and probably very exciting. But for most of us in the room, with a couple of exceptions, they're probably not that exciting, right? So, um, so I, I thought, how could I understand this system a little bit better? So I sat down for about a day, and I created a visualization of that data. So what you're seeing here is we zoom in all of those planets that had been discovered at the time from Kepler as if they were orbiting around a single star. So right away, I was able to see that these planets they're very close to their star, they're very large, they're very hot. And in understanding that, I was actually able to understand the way that this data was being measured a little bit better. So here, I'm thinking about a couple of things. I'm thinking, how can we take a data set and how can we view it from different angles, both conceptual angles and actual physical angles, to be able to discover a little bit more about the data? But I'm, I love this project because it encapsulates a strategy that I have, I think, very well and maybe better than any other project that I've done. And this strategy, uh, it's a two-word strategy. It's called ooh -ah. <laughs> And that means the first thing that I want people to do is I want them to say ooh when they see the visualization. But that ooh is useless unless there's an ah. I want that learned moment that comes, uh, that comes from, from really being able to discover something that you didn't understand before. And I think if you looked at every visualization that's been made, all my visualizations included, we can look at them and say, is there too much ooh and not enough ah? Or maybe there's too much ah and not enough ooh, meaning that only the people who are really deeply fascinated in that specific thing are ever going to pay attention to it. So a little bit later, we took the same project and working with a team in, in Los Angeles at a company called Oblong, we built this gestural interface for it, which was really exciting for me. So uh, some of you, as you're watching this video, may have the same thought that, that uh, most people do when they see this video, which is, oh, minority report. And there's a reason for that is because this is the um, John Endercoffler, who was the, uh, the uh, designer behind Minority Report. This is his company. So they're taking these things and moving them into the future. So um, I started a company in, in January called the Office for Creative Research. So we're a multidisciplinary research group. And we're thinking a lot about new engagements with data and how we can bring data to the public in really interesting ways. And one of the things that we've been doing and one of the things we've been focusing on is how do we bring data into public space? Because usually we experience data in front of this glowing screen, or we might experience it in a newspaper or in a magazine. But how do we experience it in public? How do we experience it together? So this is a project that we worked on, which is a permanent installation at the University of Texas called And That's the Way It Is. And what you're seeing here is you're seeing um, uh, 
entities being extracted from, from all of the news feeds in Austin, Texas. So this runs every day. We analyze the, the news feeds from Austin, Texas, and we extract these, what we call meaningful entities from them. So at this point, there was a, a drought in, in, in Colorado. So you see some words tied to that drought in Colorado. But depending on the day that you were viewing, this experience would be different. So to give you an idea of scale, this is uh, five stories tall and 140 feet wide. This video gives you a little bit better of an idea of what it feels like to stand in front of that building. And we've had this really interesting experience with this project where, um, where people are actually sitting down every night to come and watch the news, which we've really been excited, <laughs> excited by. Um, so information has really changed in scale. That, that is, is clear to us. But one of the things that I think I want to bring to this conversation is the idea is maybe sometimes data is not what we think it is. And we can engage with it in very different and interesting ways. This is a map of all the hotels in the world. Well, not all of them, but most of them, 700,000 hotels. Pretty interesting data set, but a pretty hard one to think about how are we going to jump into this and give people an experience of it. Because hotels are a lived experience, right? There's something that we stay in and sleep in and, and interact in. So um, we, in, we did, built this project for the Vancouver Art Gallery. And, and the thinking around this project was really heavily based on this sketch, which is a sketch by Jack Kerouac to explain the novel on the road. And we thought, what would happen if we took maps like this that we would extract from fiction, and we use them as a framework to travel through that database of 700,000 stories? So the idea goes kind of like this. One of the stories that we work with most is Lolita. And we say, if the characters of Lolita were traveling around the America today, staying in the same places that they stayed in the novel, which hotels would they stay in? How much would they pay? What would the user reviews of those hotels look like? So we built this system which runs over and over and over and over again with a set of about 30 novels. We're building a system that users are going to be able to add to this system so that we can explore this really complex data set, but this really culturally important data set through a really human uh, system, in this case, the human system of fiction. You know, my problem with our discussion around data right now is basically encapsulated in this quote, which not surprisingly comes from an advertising executive. Right, data is the new oil. Data is not the new oil. First of all, um, data, as we, I hope we're starting to learn, is deeply human. And, and, and this is something that is tied to us in all kinds of different ways. And there's a quote by Laszlo Baribashi, which I really like, and really summarizes what I think could be the future of our relationship with data. Do we want to stop different transmitted diseases? Do you want to design better cities? Do we want to stop traffic jams? Well, the data to do so is there in private hands. And we need to identify some social consensus by which the data can be shared with the different stakeholders who can take advantage of that. So the underlying um, thing that I'm trying to do with my work is I'm trying to push this type of agenda. How can we get things to really change through our conversation with data? Well, I think some part of that has already happened. And I think there is a lot of discussion about data and possibility. There, is a lot, uh, there are a lot of things that we can do with data. And we know that, and we're excited about that. In tandem, though, there is a whole question about data and ethics. How does this affect us? How does it affect our human lives? And how can we make sure that our choices with data are going to be better choices than the ones we made with oil? Right? That's my, that's my biggest problem with that metaphor. Like Everyone thinks this is such a good thing. Data is the new oil. It's like, like we need another oil? Like, <laughs> we're, uh, we're in so much trouble already. So I've taken, uh, I've taken 14 minutes now to to really answer a question which I'm sure that a lot of you had when you heard me introduced, which is why data art and why data artists? And the third thing is that I really think that this conversation can only move forward by combining dialogue, not only from scientists, not only from industry, but also from poets, from, uh, um, from actors, and, 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 and from all of these, these um, tradition, more traditional forms of art, which we know are really effective at driving um, driving change and driving conversation. Thank you.